Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. I'm sure you know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a second lesson in a new series entitled The Book of Revelation, so you know what the subject is. This lesson number two is for January 12 of 2019, entitled Among the Lampstands. Hmm, I guess we can figure out what that might be talking about. Well, before we jump into the lesson, we always like to start with a word of prayer. Would you bow with us? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you once again for this inspired book of Revelation. We appreciate so much the detailed information that we can get from it. Help us during this time through to learn more than what we have known in the past is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in this lesson, we will be discussing Revelation 1.9. We studied the first eight verses in our last lesson up through chapter 2, verse 7, the prophecy regarding Ephesus. In vision, John saw his friend Jesus Christ standing among the lampstands in the sanctuary. And I'm, I, tried to, you know, I tried to imagine myself in the situation of these people when I, when I read these prophecies. I assume that John figured out almost instantaneously that this was Jesus. And yet, it's a glorified Jesus. Would you dare to go up and give him a hug? Jesus, John fell to the ground. He didn't do that when Jesus was here as a human being. In mm -hmm. uh, a couple places in Desire of Ages, the two cleansing of the temple, mm -hmm. um, driving out the money changers there, Ellen White has an expression, divinity flashed through huma humanity. He uses that expression a number of times in the book Desire of Ages. Yeah. But especially there, and 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 that would have probably been a very limited amount. Here we're probably seeing divinity flashing through humanity in a great deal of amount, and so yeah. maybe that's why he fell rather than see him as well. Oh, hey, how are you? Been? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would be excited. I mean, if he just if if Jesus had appeared in his usual human form, he must he would have been very excited. I'm sure he he recognized him, but then. So, try to imagine how you would respond in that, in that situation. Um, we've already talked about the idea that much of Revelation focuses on events that were supposed to happen far in the future from John's day. What does that have to do with the sanctuary? Where was the sanctuary located? I mean, when we talk about sanctuary. Well, there were a number of them. Okay. Mention some. Well, there was the one in the wilderness that yes. they built, and the there tent. was uh, the one that Solomon built, mm -hmm. and then there was the one that uh, they rebuilt after the dispersion or the uh, Babylonian, Babylonian captivity, captivity Babylonian. when they came back and they rebuilt it, and then massively Her rebuilt by Herod. Yeah, he sort of really built on to it. And and what was the status of that temple in John's day when he was writing this? When he was writing it was this, gone. it had been destroyed again. It was completely gone. So why is he talking about it? Because he's not talking about that. He's talking about the heavenly sanctuary. Oh, so we're talking about something beyond this earth. And that's an important thing. You know, a lot of people will read through this and say, oh, yeah, well, that's, well, that's from the old sanctuary and put it back in the Old Testament somewhere. No, he's talking about the sanctuary in heaven. So, uh, John was one of the very first disciples to follow Jesus. Where did that take place? On the lake. The well, first encounter. Actually, the river. Yeah. Uh, wasn't John one after of the, the baptism? Right after the baptism. After yeah. his baptism. Yeah. His first time was right after the baptism. John and Andrew yeah. weren't the followers of John Peter? the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And, you know, there's, we know that John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. There's some hints, and I won't go into the details right now, but there's some hints in the New Testament that John and James were cousins of Jesus on another, in another direction. And we don't know whether, if that's really true, were they also cousins of John the Baptist? Might that have been the reason why they were down there uh, listening to what John the Baptist had to say? Um, just a possibility. Yes. John... Uh, uh, Barclay points that out. The women that were at the cross, yeah. uh, their relationship to each other, 
and he points out that very they, likely James and John's mother was a mm -hmm. cousin of Mary's. Mm -hmm. Her, so yeah. they'd be cousins once removed, or even yeah. a sister. Genealogy. Well, we don't have to get too complicated <laughs> yeah. in the language here, but yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Connection. Yeah. Well, so as John would be sitting here now on the Isle of Patmos, and we don't know how hard they worked him or what all he had to do or how his days were, were filled with water, whether they just had respect to him because he was an elderly gentleman, we don't know. But as he looked back over his life, what do you suppose would be the highlights in his life? Walking with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that three and a half years with Jesus would be an absolute high point, and that was when he was still very young. Can you think of another high, high point, maybe? Gross itself. Seeing Jesus okay. resurrected. Yeah. Come, the resurrected Christ. And I'm sure that Pentecost was a high point. Oh, yeah. Imagine the Holy Spirit coming down on you with a flame of fire, and you're looking around, and all your friends are, are seeing the Holy Spirit come down in flames of fire. Wow. And they were no longer the same. Not the same at all. So they took up the challenge at that point of spreading the gospel to the world. Only the problem was they thought the world was going to come to them and they would spread the gospel from Jerusalem and the people would take it back out to wherever they came from. It took quite a while for them to adopt the idea that, no, they were not supposed to sit in Jerusalem and wait for people to come to them. They were supposed to go out and carry the gospel to the world in every direction. I think they felt bad that uh, it was this grafted guy, Paul, was doing the work, so that's why they went up. Yeah. And it was not just the Jews that they finally realized this, the gospel had to go to the Gentiles as well. Yeah. And that was a challenge. That would be a challenge for sure. Okay, Gordon, I think you have something about what happened to John that led up to his being on the Isle of Patmos. From Acts of the Apostles. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant even as he preserved the th three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared, my master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. Mm. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. I wonder what they said to him at that point. Can we help you out? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> excuse us, we didn't really mean to throw you into that. I mean, you, how could, you know, how, what, what, what explanation did they give for the fact that the guy didn't cook? Well, it was the same thing as the people that watched what happened to the three worthies. Yeah. yeah. The people that threw them in fell down dead. Yeah. They stepped out when called I think on. The word is dumbfounded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Exactly. Go ahead. Continuing on page 570, again, the hand of persecution fell heavily upon the apostle. By the emperor's decree, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, condemned for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here his enemies thought his influence would no longer be felt, and he must die of hardship and distress. Wow. Okay. Domitian himself thought, the Roman Caesar thought, okay, I'm going to get rid of this guy, throw him into a pot of boiling oil. Well, that didn't work. Okay, we'll send him to Patmos. We're going to get rid of him that way. That didn't work either. <laughs> well, because John could not be killed by throwing him into the pot of boiling oil, Domitian himself commanded that John be exiled to Patmos. What do we know about Patmos, Kerry? Patmos is a barren, rocky island in the Aegean Sea. It is 10 miles long and 6 miles across at its widest point. The Romans used it, together with other surrounding islands, as a penal colony for banished political offenders. 
early Christian authors living relatively close to the time of the writing of the book of Revelation state unanimously that Roman authorities had banished John to Patmos because of his faithfulness to the gospel. <coughs> On Patmos, the aged apostle surely endured all the hardships of Roman imprisonment. He probably was treated as a criminal, changed in fetters, given insufficient food, and forced to perform hard labor under the lash of the whip of merciless Roman guards. Ooh. Wow. And Ooh. you know, even to this day, there's very little there. You can yeah. hike up to the cave. Yeah. But when you see the little tiny village there, the place to get a little something to eat, you're just amazed that that little rocky island is still pretty barren. I'm pretty and amazed that it's even there. Yeah, yeah, but it's a long ways away yeah. in feeling from mm -hmm. the mainland, which isn't yeah. far away. Yeah. How old was John at that time? Well, it's hard to know exactly, but he was probably born plus or minus a few years of Jesus. That would make him 90, 90 85 to 95, somewhere in that range. At the time on the Patmos. Mm -hmm. Dennis, you going to carry on there for us? Yes, this is from Acts of the Apostles by Ellen G. White, 570 paragraph 4 to 571 at the top uh, the events that would take place in the closing scenes of this earth's history were outlined before him and there he wrote out the visions he received from God when his voice could no longer testify to the one whom he loved and served the messages given him on that barren coast were to go forth as a lamp that burneth declaring the sure purpose of the Lord concerning every nation on the earth. Wow. Well, John was certainly not the first faithful servant of God to suffer. Can you think of a few that we could name right away? What happened to the three worthies in Daniel? What happened to Daniel himself, thrown into the lion's den? What happened to Stephen? I mean, what happened to John the Baptist? I mean, what how many? What happened to his brother? Yeah. James. James yeah. 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 Paul wrote to his young spiritual son, Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. Is that, uh, has that prophecy lost any of its force? Any of you have been persecuted this last week? Now, some, some of us might think we're being persecuted sometimes, <laughs> but um, we're not persecuted very much. I don't think it qualifies. You don't think it qualifies, but the time is coming. If we run into difficulties and feel that we are suffering for one reason or another, how can we be sure whether it is because of our own bad choices or it is because we are serving God? Can we learn to trust God faithfully no matter what happens? Well, a very important uh, a verse in this first chapter of Revelation is Revelation 1, verse 10. I'm going to read it from the Good News Bible. On the Lord's day, the Spirit took control of me, and I heard a loud voice that, surrounded like, that sounded like a trumpet speaking behind me. And, of course, the critical passage, the critical phrase in there is the Lord's day. What was John talking about? There, this has been debated back and forth and up and down from the time, almost the time it was written until the current time. This exact expression in Greek, the Lord's Day, is unique in the Bible. No other places are found either in the New Testament written by the Apostles or the Old Testament is translated in the, in the form of the Septuagint. The exact words. Um, However, where there are many other similar expressions used. For example, Exodus 31, 13. Let's just look at that for a moment. To say, the Lord commanded Moses to say to the people of Israel, keep the Sabbath my day of rest, because it is signed between you and me. My day of rest. Who does it sound like that day belongs to? The Lord. Look at Isaiah 58, verse 13. The Lord says, if you treat the Sabbath as sacred and do not pursue your own interest on that day, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling, who's claiming it as his holy day? The Lord himself. The Lord. Matthew 12, verse, 20, verse 18. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. 
Okay, very, it's also Mark 2, 27 and 28, which clearly identify the seventh day as the Lord's day. So, do we, do we, is that sufficient reason for believing that he's talking about the seventh day Sabbath here in Revelation 1, 10? Well, at the time, you would think that it would have been a, a well understood expression, whatever, whichever way it went, it, it would have to be, because otherwise he would have just said, first day of the week or the Sabbath or whatever but he says the Lord's Day why why would he make up something brand new uh, on the spur of the moment uh, if it wasn't already something that others would recognize I've had the privilege of studying six years of Greek New Testament Greek and the days of the week did not have names like we have today it's the first of the Sabbath the second of the Sabbath the third of the Sabbath, the fourth of the Sabbath, up to, and then the Sabbath. The Sabbath. So, I mean, I don't know how you could get that mixed up. It's well, anyway. Yeah. Well, the Catholic Church straight away says, says "Hey, this is our doing." Yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. they make no bones about that. So many places. Okay, Charles, you want to read us that? Oh, go ahead, Gordon. I'm fascinated to see the footnote in the My Good News translation for 110, the Lord's Day. This is the first time the expression the Lord's Day is used to designate the first day of the week. Hmm. That is to say Sunday. Really? Yes. Wow, okay, we're going to find out about that in just a moment. <laughs> Charles, you want to read for us? Yes, sir. It was on the Sabbath that the Lord of glory appeared the exalted episode. The Sabbath was as sacredly observed by John and Patmos as when he was preaching to the people in the towns and cities of Judah. He claimed as his own the precious promises that had been given regarding that day. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, 581, paragraph 4. Okay. Want to go ahead there? The scriptures are clear that God's day is the seventh day Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 10, Mark 2, 27, 28. But the custom of calling Sunday the Lord's day is so ancient that a number of Roman languages have included it even in the name for Sunday. In Spanish, the very day Domingo and the French Dimanche. Latin, Latin is Dominica. The very first reference to Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection, as the Lord's day, goes back to an eccentric bishop of Antioch by the nickname of Ignatius. For hundreds of years, Saturday was still known as the Sabbath, and Sunday was called the Lord's day by most Christians. Curious, around the year 1600, English Puritans began to call Sunday the Lord's the Sabbath. There is no evidence before the second century AD of anyone using the Lord's day or Sabbath to refer the first day of the week, which we call Sunday. See Mervyn Maxwell, God Cares, <coughs> Volume 2 and page 82 to 86. Okay, so where did this idea come from? Well, the first unambiguous use of the term Lord's Day for the first day of the week, in this instance specifically talking about Resurrection Sunday, appears in the little book called The Gospel of Peter. Now that's a pseudepigraphical, uninspired book which was probably written around A.D. 175. And, Jim? And in the night in which the Lord's day was dawning on, as the soldiers kept guard two by two in a watch, there was a great voice in the heaven, and they saw the heavens opened, and two men descend from thence with great light and approach the tomb. And that stone which was put at the door rolled off, off by itself, and the tomb was opened, and both the young men entered in. And at dawn, upon the Lord's day, Mary Magdalene, a disciple of the Lord, fearing because of the Jews, since they were burning with wrath, had not done at the Lord's sepulchre that things which women are wont to do for those that die and are for those that are beloved by them. She took her friends with her, and came to the sepulchre where he laid. So that uses the Lord's Day twice. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is an uninspired, 
pseudepigraphical book. It was not written by Peter. It was written by someone else using the name of Peter to try to give it more authority. So the Sabbath which God has instituted, had instituted in Eden was as precious to John on the lonely island, uh, as on the lonely isle. And again, Ellen White has something to say about that. Margaret? What a Sabbath was to that lonely exile, always precious in the sight of Christ, but, more, but now more than ever exalted. Never had he learned so much of Jesus. Never had he heard such exalted truth. Ellen G. White comments, Youth Instructor, April 5, 1900, paragraph 4 to 6. Great. Well, we know about the, the commandments, but let's just read the, the final verse of the Sabbath commandment. I guess we'll have time. We'll take time to read the, the whole commandment. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. And six days I, the Lord, made the earth, the sea, the sea, and everything in, in them. But on the seventh day I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So why did he bless the Sabbath? Because of creation. Mm -hmm. Because of creation. But then we turn over to Deuteronomy 5 and we read something a little different. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. So up to that point, it's verbatim from Exodus 20. Your slaves must rest just as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So that's clear evidence that the Sabbath was just for Jews, right? No. Mm -hmm. No? Well, he's telling them why he commanded to them to keep the Sabbath as they were coming out of Egypt. There was a distinctive uh, awakening of the, or repositioning of the Sabbath uh, at that time. Uh, in the first one, he's referring back to creation. That's why I made it holy. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is more of a... Okay, so God says, worship me because I'm the one who created you. It's a celebration of the Sabbath. And then now he's saying, worship me because I rescued you from Egyptian slavery. I recreated you. I recreated, you if you will, yeah. So um, thus we see that both creation and deliverance or redemption are to be celebrated on the Sabbath day. Now look at Revelation 1, 12 to 18 and compare Daniel 10, 5 and 6. I want you just to, because we're, we're trying to get, we, we're trying to encourage you to realize that almost everything in the book of Revelation has a parallel somewhere in the Old Testament. I'll read first of all from Revelation 1, 12 to 18. I turned around to see who was talking to me and I saw seven gold lampstands. And among them, there was what looked like a human being, wearing a robe that reached to his feet and a gold belt round his chest. His hair was white as wool or as snow, and his eyes blazed like fire. His feet shone like brass that had been refined and polished, and his voice sounded like a roaring waterfall. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. His face was as bright as the midday sun. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now I'm alive forever and ever. I have authority over death and the world of the dead. So that's the Revelation version. Now look at Daniel 10, 5 and 6. I looked up. This is Daniel now talking. I looked up and saw someone who was standing wearing linen clothes and a belt of fine gold. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. His body shone like a jewel. His face was as bright as a flash of, light, as a flash of lightning. His eyes blazed like fire, his arms and legs shone like polished bronze, and his voice sounded like the roar of a great waterfall, a great crowd, I'm sorry. I was the one, only one who saw the vision. So let's just look at the parallels there. <laughs> Revelation 1 says, a robe that reached to his feet. Daniel 10 says, linen clothes. Revelation 12, 1 says, a gold belt. Daniel 10 says, a belt of fine gold. Revelation 1 says, his eyes blazed like fire. Daniel 10 says, his eyes blazed like fire. Revelation 1 says, His feet shone like brass that has been refined and polished. 
Daniel 10 says his arms and legs shone like polished bronze. Da Revelation 1 says his voice sounded like a roaring waterfall. Daniel 10 says his voice sounded like the roar of the great crowd. So what do you suppose is going on here? Is he, is this, is this plagiarism? No. Seeing the same the scene. Same person. Um, See, yeah. Same person seen by a different person. Gabriel was. years apart. Wasn't it Gabriel in, in chapter 10? No. Some people think it's Gabriel. That's not J Gabriel. Uh, he was held back for three weeks. Yeah, but then he called somebody else, I think, and this is the person who was called. Michael. Michael the Archangel. So these were written in different languages mm -hmm. and then translated into English, and they come through almost the same, so. It's amazingly the same. Yeah. Even though mm -hmm. one is describing it in the year 530 or something, and mm -hmm. John does it 90 years after yeah. the time of 600 years later. Christ was born. Yeah. Well, uh, look at Revelation 1, 19 and 20. Write then the things you see, both the things that are now and the things that will happen afterwards. What's that talking about again? Future. Future. A future. Obviously. This is the secret meaning of the seven stars that you see in your right in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands. So here he says it's whose hand? My right hand. And of the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. By the way, just a little bit of um uh, clarification here. The seven things that appear in Revelation 1 are not candlesticks. The King James has candlesticks because that was the kind of light sources they were using often in that time. These were not candlesticks. These were clearly lampstands. They were little oil lamps that are shaped about like your palm of your hand. They had a place where you could pour in the oil and there was a little wick that came out the other end. So these are seven gold Excuse me, seven gold lampstands. These are not candlesticks. Okay, just a question of translation here. And what do they stand for? Seven churches. Yeah. And the golden lampstands were the seven churches. The stars were the messengers to the seven churches, and the lampstands were the seven churches. So uh, those lamps were originally lit from fire provided by God Himself, and that fire was never supposed to go out. That's interesting. Original fire was lit by God in that tabernacle in the, t in, in the tent out there at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God says, this fire is never supposed to go out. So they carried a live fire all the way along. Yep. They didn't, I assume they didn't through the captivity though. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Probably not during the captivity, yeah. So did God light it for them again? I don't know. The temple know. was destroyed when they went yeah. into the capital. How about earlier in David's went. time? No. Nope. In they David's can't. time, I mean, the Philistines had this stuff for a while, didn't they? they well, they had the ark. Just the ark. Just the ark. Oh. Yeah. So the tent was still somewhere the in, yeah. in the realm. Yeah. Because remember, the reason they had the ark was because Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, took the ark with them into battle. The, the tabernacle was left behind and the That's lampstands right. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. In fact, that lampstand, interestingly enough, was the, the Romans forced the Jews to carry that lampstand, the one that came from Moses. They carried that lampstand from Jerusalem to Rome. And it was in the Rome till about 400 AD or something like that when the Vandals came from North Africa and stole it. And it finally disappeared somewhere in North Africa. Same lampstand from presumably the fire from the was days still of Moses. Morning. When you go to Rome, the is it the gate yeah. of Titus? It has yeah. the lampstand yep. um, picture right. of it on, on the end. You go, you walk yeah. through the through the that gate. Mm -hmm. You look up there, and there it There's is. There's a lampstand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. We got exactly. a picture of that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the re, uh, Revel look at Revelation two nine, two verses two nine thirteen nineteen Revelation three one eight and fifteen. Um, this is, we don't need to read all those verses, but let me read a couple of them so you just see what we're talking about here as soon as I can identify my cursor. 
I know what you have done. I know how hard you've been, you have worked and how patient you have been. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested, have tested those who say they are apostles but are not and have found, that, found out that they are liars. What is that telling us? Let's just pick another one. Look at verse 9. I know your troubles. This is written to a different church. I know that you're poor, but you really are rich. I know the evil things said against you by those who claim to be Jews, but are not. And so what we find out is that we go through the book of Revelation. What do we find? I mean, through, the, through these messages to the seven churches. And each church, God says, I know, I know, I know, I know. What, what does that tell us? That he's intimately concerned He's, he's paying attention to what's happening in their church. God knows every detail. I think of the, in the story of Acts. He told the, the messengers from Cornelius, go down there and you will find someone by the name of Peter in the house of Simon the Tanner, Tanner in, the book of, in, in the city of Joppa. And he'll be right there. I mean, details. Mm -hmm. Details. Yeah. As Christians, well, what does it mean to suggest, as in Revelation 1.18, that he is the one who lives and possesses the keys of Hades and of death? What does that tell us? He has power to give us life. And what's the proof of the best proof of that? Well, he rose from the His dead himself. He rose from death himself, yes. and he did it in whose power? His own power. He didn't need anybody else helping him. He rose in his own power right there. Yeah. And he says, I have those keys. I got out of the grave myself. I can save you in the same way. And there's lots of places in the scripture. Job 17, 16, Psalm 9, 13, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 25, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, etc. Well, among Christians in modern times, there have been generally two different approaches to studying the book of Revelation. To many Christians, the book is full of mysteries that they cannot understand and generally, they therefore don't bother to read it. On the other hand, many Christian scholars believe that not even God has the ability to predict the future, so they try to interpret all the details of the book of Revelation in light of events going on in the days of John himself. So what's happening in their, in their case? They're taking their own preconceived ideas and they're enforcing them on the scriptures, aren't they? They're saying, we know that God can't predict the future. Therefore, this is what we do to interpret the book of Revelation. But if you take the book of Revelation as it reads and you say, okay, what is God trying to say to me? It's very clear that he's said repeatedly, let me tell you about things that are going to happen afterwards, things which are to come, things which are in the future, etc. And sometimes those people who don't believe that God can predict the future don't overtly say it. They just no, say, this no. is how we interpret yeah. Revelation. We interpret it as events that were happening. Or how Daniel was written. Mm -hmm. Critical scholars think Daniel, a lot of it was written during the days of the Maccabees mm -hmm. because they wrote after the fact and everything seemed to fit the history of their time. So we know that these, the rest of chapter 2 and chapter 3 are written to the churches at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those, those are the churches. Were those the only Christian churches in Asia Minor in those days? No. no. Not at all. There are quite a number of them. So why do you think he picked out those churches? Well, we have an idea as a church. We, we do two things. We do three things, actually, in, in with these passages. We take, first of all, the historical application. We know that there were actual churches, well known to John, well known to Paul and others who lived in those days, that they had been to and visited, and they knew people who lived there. So when, John, when, when God said to, to John, okay, this is my message to Ephesus, what's John thinking of? He knows Ephesus, and he knows the people who live there, and Smyrna, and Pergamum, and so forth. He knows those churches, he knows the people who live there. That's the historical application. Um, we know that, you know, people who had those ideas suffered martyrdom. 
Uh, th there are plenty of people who wanted to kill them, but uh, this was the local historical application right there. But we also believe that there's a prophetic application. We know for sure that there were many other churches in Asia Minor besides those that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. This suggests that these churches were chosen specifically because their spiritual conditions were to coincide with certain future spiritual conditions of God's church and different historical periods. Thus, we can look at the seven churches as prophecies laid out in history, the, in the history of our world up until the time when Jesus comes again, and we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in the future. There's also a universal application. What do we mean by universal application? We know that there were people in every church down through history that probably fit the description of each of the, the different churches. So we're not saying everybody in Laodicea is perfectly Laodicean or everybody who's in Ephesus is perfectly Ephesian and so forth. We're saying there's some mixture, but in the overall picture of things, these different time periods represent um, the people who lived during, represent, are, are represented by these churches and their various names here. Um, well, the characteristics, for example, of the Church of Laodicea might be the most common characteristic to be found in God's final end-time church. There are, no doubt, other people in God's end-time church with characteristics of some of the other churches. Clearly, this is God's attempt to meet us in our spiritual condition to meet fallen human beings where they are, quoting Ellen White, letter 121-1901, and other places. Try to imagine how you would respond if you heard that your pastor had had a vision during the week. A message like one of these messages from one of these churches was given to him and he was told, okay, stand up on Sabbath morning and tell your church that this message applies to you. How would you respond? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Depends on whether you had ears to hear and eyes to see. Mm -hmm. That has happened in certain areas of the world. Yep. I heard about something just this week, and you wonder how the Holy Spirit's working. Um, there's a gentleman who was the pastor of a, a certain ethnic church in this area. He speaks a very foreign language to English, and he's a pastor of that church. He has a daughter who is one of the faculty here at Loma Linda. And um, she speaks some of that language at home with her family, but not much of her original language. But she speaks English. I mean, she grew up, she came here as a child. English is her language. But when it comes Sabbath morning, because they want English and their native language to be spoken in church, the pastor speaks in English and she translates his entire sermon and perfect local language. And as soon as the sermon is over, she can't speak good language anymore, that language anymore. Mm. What's happening there? Mm. Tongues. This is a person that I know very personally. Wow. Well. How does okay. she explain that? The only, the, only, the, only way, the only way there is to explain it, mm. the Spirit's there. Mm, wow. Well, so um, in the Roman Empire of John's day, Rome was the largest and most important city. It was followed in size and importance by Alex Alexandria and Egypt. Why was Alexandria and Egypt so important? It was a large and powerful city, but what else is important about it? It has a library. A library, that was an important factor. Where the it was the breadbasket. Mm. It was the breadbasket. When the, all the countries in the north were out of food, they could still ship food from, from, um, from Egypt, basically, through um, Alexandria. And, and then Antioch in Syria was the third most largest, most powerful city. The fourth position fell to either Ephesus or Corinth. Ephesus was clearly the principal city in the Roman province of Asia. It was not the capital of Asia, Pergamum was even though some people will try to claim that Ephesus was. No, Pergamum was the capital of, of Asia Minor, but it was located at the terminus of the Caister Valley and the Caister River. 
but there were roads that converged, con converged on Ephesus from every direction. Roads came from as far away as the far off Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. Ephesus was considered to be the seaport and the market of Asia. It was the gateway also to Asia for those who came from the west. Whenever a new proconsul came from Rome to officiate in Asia Minor, that proconsul had to enter Asia Minor via Ephesus and first be recognized there. In later times, the Christians were brought from Asia to be flung to the lions in the arena in Rome. Ignatius, one of the, early, of the later Christian historians, called Ephesus the highway of the martyrs. Ephesus was the wealthiest and greatest city in all of Asia Minor. It was a free city. They had bestowed, bestowed honors on the Roman Caesars frequently enough to be given that status. It was more or less self-governing. They never had Roman troops garrisoned there. Now, for those of you who know something of the history of those cities, there was a constant ba a rivalry between Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum as to which one of them would receive the most honors from the Roman government. It was a little bit like some city being recognized as the, the most progressive or best or most beautiful city in the United States. And, and, and sometimes Ephesus was honored, sometimes Smyrna was honored, sometimes Pergamum was honored. Actually, Smyrna got, uh, got honored the most of all, and as, it, as it finally worked out. But these, this was a constant competition, so they were always trying to do things to please the Roman government. Ephesus was also the center of the worship of Artemis, or in Latin, in the King James, Diana of the Ephesians. What do we know about that temple of Diana of the Ephesians? Big. Well, first of all, it was located a short distance outside the actual city of Ephesus. If you go there and visit, it, visit Ephesus today, what do you see? One cobbled together pillar is left. One cobbled together. You can't even be sure it's all the pieces. You know, these pieces are stacked up there, and you can't even be sure they all came from the same pillar in the, back in the beginning. That's all that's left. The, 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 that thing has been taken apart. Pieces have been used to build. Pieces were used to build the, the, the Muslim mosque at the top of the hill above it, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, it, But it, it was huge. It was a 425 feet long and 220 feet wide. It had 112 columns each 60 feet high. 36 of those columns were richly gilded and inlaid. The so-called goddess Artemis, I should say, for those of you who want to get a picture of it, it was four times as large as the Parthenon in Athens. Oh. That's a huge building set up there. We, we've all seen pictures of it. This one was four times as big as the Parthenon. So each of those pillars is 60 feet high. 36 of those columns were richly gilded in Italy. So-called goddess Artemis is pictured as a squat, black, many-breasted figure which had come down from ancient times. None knew its origin. Some claim that it was carved from uh, a meteorite mm. that originally came from heaven. Don't know that that's true, but... There were already temples in Ephesus for the worship of Claudius and Nero. Later temples were added for Hadrian and Severus. And, and you will see them if you go. There. You walk down the uh, road and there they are. Ephesus was also famous for its pagan amulets and charms, which are supposed to be infallible remedies for sickness. Ephesus was home to a wide variety of citizens. Some of them were original natives to that country. Others were colonists who had moved there from Athens. And some were Jews. And we have a comment. I think this is yours, Jim. Besides being a center of religion, the Temple of Artemis was also the center of crime and immorality. The temple area possessed the right of asylum. Any criminal was safe if he could reach it. The temple possessed hundreds of priestesses who were sacred prostitutes. All this combined to make Ephesus a notoriously evil place. Heraclitus one of the most famous of ancient philosophers was known as the weeping philosopher. His explanation of his tears was that no one could live in Ephesus without weeping as its immorality. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. As it's Quoted by William Barclay. Yeah. 1976. 
Revelation. Two. Wow. So imagine if the place, the church where you went to worship on Sabbath was full of escaped prisoners, cr escaped criminals that hadn't been caught by the law, and th hundreds, maybe thousands of sacred prostitutes. Hmm. What kind of worship service would that be? Well, we are all sinners. <laughs> we don't need to go to church to do our sinning. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Well, look at Revelation 2, 1 to 4. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know what you have done. I know how hard you have worked and how patient you have been. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested those who say they are apostles but are not and have found out that they are liars. You are patient. You have suffered for my sake and you have not given up. But this is what I have against you. You do not love me now as you did at first. So what's the condition, the general condition of the church at Ephesus? Their love it's has gone declining, down. isn't it? Yes. It's not what it was back in the beginning. Clearly, the Ephesian church is a model church in its early days under Aquila, Priscilla, Paul, Apollos, and Timothy. It is also quite possible that Onesimus, we've talked about this in this class before, if you happen to be listening in those days, Onesimus, spoken of in the small book of Philemon, may have later become one of the church leaders in Ephesus. But unfortunately, we have Revelation 2, 5 to 7, and here's what God later said about Ephesus. Think how far you have fallen. Turn from your sins and do what you did at first. If you don't turn from your sins, I will come to you and take your lampstand from its place. But this is what you have in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I do. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to eat the fruit of the tree of life that grows in the garden of God. So that's the message to the church at Ephesus. Over time, the church in Ephesus gradually <coughs> fell away from its first love. God called them to think about how far they had fallen, to turn from their sins, and to go back to their first love. Seventh-day Adventists in general have equated the church at Ephesus as a symbol of the Christian church from A.D. 31. What happened in A.D. 31? Uh, Stoning Stoning Stephen. Stephen. No, that was A.D. 34. 31 is the crucifixion of Christ. Christ. <coughs> During the apostolic age <coughs> down to 100 A.D., probably about the time John died. Have you ever belonged to a Christian group where you felt that the Christian love was waning? Perhaps everyone was attending, um, and I, I don't like to mention my own experience too often, but without mentioning any names, some years ago I attended a, a school, not here in Loma Linda, but another part of the country, and there were several Adventist churches around there, and we visited one of the smaller churches. We didn't want to go to one of the great huge churches, so let's go to a smaller church where we can get involved and participate and so forth. So we went to one of the smaller churches, and people were friendly, but there, there, there just was not much going on there. It was just kind of, hmm. So the next Sabbath, we went to another church that was just alive, and things were happening and so forth. So you can guess which church we, we, <laughs> we attended. And later, the some of the people from that first church come and say, why didn't you come to our church? And we said, nothing was happening there. It was sad. Well, perhaps everyone was attending church and going through the motions of being a Christian, but nothing was really happening. What should we do if we find ourselves in a church like that? Gordon? You want to help us? From uh, Ellen White and the Houston Structure, April 5, 1900. The appearance of Christ to John should be to all, believers and unbelievers, an evidence that we have a risen Christ. It should give living power to the church. At times, dark clouds surround God's people. It seems as if oppression and persecution would extinguish them. But at such times, the most instructive lessons are given. Christ often enters prisons and reveals himself to his chosen ones. He is in the fire with them at the stake. 
As in the darkest night the stars shine the brightest, so the most brilliant beams of God's glory are revealed in the, in the deepest gloom. The darker the sky, the more clear and impressive are the beams of the Son of Righteousness, the risen Savior. Yes, instructor, April 5, 1900. Wow. Well, look at Revelation 1, 12 to 20. I think we have time to read this. I turned around to see who was talking to me, and I saw seven gold lampstands. And among them there was what looked like a human being, wearing a robe that reached to his feet and gold belt round his chest. His hair was white as wool or as snow, and his eyes blazed like fire. His feet shone like brass that has been refined and polished, and his voice sounded like a roaring waterfall. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. His face was as bright as the midday sun. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now I'm alive forever and ever. I have authority over death and the world of the dead. Right then, the things you see both the things that are now and the things that will happen afterwards. This is the secret meaning of the seven stars that you see in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So clearly God is saying, I have a very important message for this group of people. Please carry it for me. So try to imagine yourself on a quiet Sabbath afternoon. Maybe you're doing a little reading or meditating. And all of a sudden you have a vision, seeing Jesus Christ himself as John saw him. How do you think you would react? Probably as John did. Yeah, like he did. Yeah. John was probably 90 years old and nearly so, or nearly so, when he received the visions recorded in Revelation. What do you suppose was the history of his Christian experience? High point surely must have been the time when he was with Jesus on this earth. Pentecost certainly must have been another high point. We do not know a lot about what happened for the next 60 years. We know, we, we read some stories about his traveling with Peter and performing some miracles there in Jerusalem in the early days. But then we don't know much. Um, early church history suggests that John finally moved to Ephesus, Ephesus and became the head of the church there that he took Mary, Jesus' mother, with him. Remember, she, he told John, mm. please look after mother. And if you go to Ephesus, there's a small house, sort of off to the side a little bit, and they claim that that's where Mary lived in Ephesus and where she finally died. Possible, we don't know for sure. So what have we learned from these few verses in Revelation 1? We have clearly identified the Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10. It is clear that Jesus knows where we are and what we are doing, and he meets us where we are. Three, John was clearly told that his visions would include details about the current conditions of churches in Asia Minor, but they also were about the future of the Christian church down to the end of time. Four, we are left with the challenge of interpreting the seven distinct messages to the seven churches. So we have to figure out what these messages meant, what they meant to those people, what they should mean to us now. So why do you think the book of Revelation starts with, starts with the picture of Jesus in the sanctuary among the lampstands? Lamp why would it start there? Well, well, it was about the churches. Yeah, and there's pretty much no question about who, who was talking here. We are told that John fell at his feet. We read that. Jesus lifted him up. Didn't John immediately recognize who this person was? Did he who this person was? Did you try to greet him or welcome him in any way? I mean, wouldn't you want to do that if it was just your friend? But this guy appears not just as an ordinary friend. Well, we will be interested to note that as we work our way through the book of Revelation, we will find Jesus located at different spots in the sanctuary. In fact, he goes systematically through the holy place and finally into the most holy place as we work our way through the book of Revelation. So, Carrie, I think you have some final words for us about that progress. The best explanation for the Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10 is that John was referring to the seventh day Sabbath. While the exact phrase, the Lord's Day, Kyriake Hamera, is never used elsewhere in the New Testament or in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, many strong equivalents refer to the seventh day Sabbath. 
The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, in brackets it says Kyria with a K, thy God, from Exodus 20.10, Deuteronomy 5.14. The Lord, Kyrios, often refers to the seventh day as my Sabbath, Ta Sabata Mao, Exodus 31.12 and 13, and there are quite a few texts there. In the Hebrew of Isaiah 58:13, Yahweh calls the Sabbath my holy day, as from the New King James Version. And finally, all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew 12:8, Mark 2:27 and 28, Luke 6:5, quote Jesus as saying that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Curios tu sabatu. It would be strange, therefore, if John used the phrase the Lord's Day for any other day of the week than the one we call Saturday. That should be pretty clear, shouldn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, look at Revelation 4, just as we're getting ready to sort of where we, see where we are in the history of things here. At this point, I had another vision and saw an open door in heaven, and the voice that sounded like a trumpet, which I had heard speaking to me before, said, come up here and I'll show you what, what must happen after this what must happen after this, okay? As a matter of fact, we know that the book of Revelation includes the earliest history of the great controversy even before this world was created. And where do we find that? Revelation 12. Revelation 12, yeah. He goes back to pre-creation, doesn't he? Well, John had known the human Jesus for years. Jesus was always gracious and for forgiving. And as we know, on one occasion, wash the feet of his disciples. Would God do such a thing? Why do you think he appeared in Revelation in this awesome way, standing in what appears to be the holy place of the tabernacle? Divinity flashing through humanity. The fact that Jesus addressed himself to each of those seven churches, each with, each with its own problems and characteristics, should make it clear to us that he understands every single one of us what our needs are and what our hopes are. He understands exactly what he can do for us or to help us. Are we ready to accept his offer? The book of Revelation opens with a bang. An exciting time and we are here to ride along. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these recorded messages which give us many clues about you and about your character and about your plan for our world and what you've done in the past and what you're going to do in the future. Help us to be ready that we may assist you in whatever way we can as your faithful children to bring all that to pass as Peter says we should is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.